generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. A lot of our time on earth is vanity. Except what you do for the Lord. One generation passes, then here comes another one, only to forget the last generation. And there is something very thought-provoking about time. When you look at old pictures and think about how that photo was once the present, it can freak you out a bit. Because for a second, what took place in that photo was the time present. Just like you're in the present now, and you think, you know, you, you're you not thinking about death. You're not thinking that in 40 years I'll be dead. Or you're not thinking, well, somebody's going to look at this picture in 50 years. And they'll be thinking about me being dead while they're looking at the picture. And when you realize how fast time goes, it makes you consider e eternity. Deuteronomy 32, 29 says, Oh, that they were wise that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. In this present life, you think hurt and sorrow and trouble and pain will pass with time, and it might, but in hell, it won't pass. Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And Luke 18, 30, Luke 18, 29 and 30, it says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. When Jesus actually said these words, there was a time when he said these words, and that was the present time. Think about this. There was more time passed between Jesus Christ and Noah's flood than there is between Jesus Christ and this present time we're in now. And looking at pictures of people who are dead should remind you that in the moment the picture was taken, that person probably didn't have death in their mind. Maybe it was a picture of your mother as a young woman or your father as a young man. When that picture was taken, most likely he wasn't thinking about his death. And now you're looking at that picture after they've passed. But people take selfies today and in those pictures that they take, I doubt death is on their mind or the fact of how we have but a short time, I doubt that's on their mind. People aren't thinking about time and how quick you can die and how quick time's going. Just a second passes. Uh, and many older people say, where has the time gone? They're waking up 70 years old and they don't know what happened to the last 30 years. And many strong men find out they aren't so strong once they get older. They say, Father, time's caught up to them. And Psalm 79 one says, cast me not off in the time of old age, forsake me not when my strength faileth. Psalms 31, 9 and 10 says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. Things in your life can get better with time. But they also get worse with time. Mostly they get worse. Things are coming together. Things aren't coming together. They're falling apart. A, a car doesn't look newer. The longer you have it, it starts looking worse. Uh, Job 14.1 says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Life, for the most part, is full of trouble. It's sag, bag, and drag. I mean, there's some exciting moments and some exciting times, but th for the most part, it's full of trouble. And time goes by quickly. It's Monday, you blink, and then it's Friday. And I remember as a kid in the late 90s when I would see any music or movies from the 80s, I thought it was ancient to be in like living in 1998 and then seeing something from like 1985 or something. 
But now it's 2019, and when I look back on 2009, which was just 10 years ago, it doesn't seem that long ago to me. Whereas in 1998, when I was young, I look back at 1988, and it seemed like forever ago. I mean, that's the year I was born. I remember as a kid being able to recognize the 80s and 90s by a certain theme or music or clothes, but now from like 2003 to 2019, it just all runs together. And I remember as a kid seeing the Twin Towers go down live on TV, and that doesn't seem that long ago, and that was almost 20 years ago, compared to when I lived in the late 90s, only being 10 years out from the 80s. It's crazy how that 10 years from 1998 to 19 from 1988 to 1998 seems so long but then that 20 years from 2001 to 2019 almost 20 years doesn't seem that long your perception of time changes as time goes on you begin realizing how precious time is and how it is a gift and that's why Paul said in Ephesians 5:16 redeeming the time because the days are evil I remember when I first started kind of thinking about time. As a lost boy on the bus, I was 15 years old, and I remember sitting on the bus and thinking, as a freshman in high school, it won't be long till I'll be a senior. And every now and then I'll think back about how I thought that when I sit there on the bus. I was 15 then, and now I'm 30. And the 15 years have gone by fast. I mean, I've already lived double what I had lived at that moment. And if you're in your 20s, it is a good chance you're older than your mother was when she birthed you. That will mess up with your perception of time. Colossians 4, 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Something else crazy about time just a fun time fact, Barbara Walters, Anne Frank, and Martin Luther King were all born the same year. That will mess with your brain. Little facts like that. If you grew up in the 90s, like I did, then you probably watched the show The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I'm not endorsing the show, but it's something that I watched as a lost kid. Will Smith was always one of those cool guys that it seemed like he would never get old. But the crazy thing is that now Will Smith is 50 or older, and he's older than Uncle Phil was in the show. I mean, everybody looked at Uncle Phil like he was some big old nerd or something. And now Will Smith is older than he was when he was on the show. Uh, People are supposed to get better with time, wiser and smarter, and this seems to be something of the pastime. Remember how wise old people used to be? That is, if you're old now, you might remember the wisdom of your parents. But people are forsaking the command to put away childish things. It is almost as if their minds stop growing between the ages of 18 and 25. They try to be cool and listen to the same music that their kid does. They try to go out and party all night and just live like a young adult that's very unwise and stupid in first corinthians thirteen eleven, it says when i was a child i spake as a child i understood as a child i thought as a child and when i became a man i put away childish things is time not making you wiser and smarter are you not learning from the experiences from everyday life about how you need to do better are you not learning from your mistakes how that sin causes pain and suffering But now you have mothers who try to act so young that they get jealous of their own daughters. They want to look as good in the teenage clothes. And today you see a lot of times a good kid is actually wiser wiser than some of the parents. I know of women who call their daughters to get advice. In Proverbs 22.6 it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old he will not depart from it. The kid shouldn't have to train you when he gets older because you ought to have started acting like you've got some sense by the time you're in your 30s and 40s. And I remember back in like 2003, 
sitting at school arguing with my friends on who would be better, LeBron James or Car- Carmelo Anthony. And that was the year they were drafted. And to give you an idea how long ago this was, because it doesn't seem that long ago, like for me it doesn't, but LeBron played against Kobe and Shaq when they were both on the Lakers. That's how long ago that was. I mean, when you think about Kobe and Shaq being on the same team on the Lakers, that seems like a while ago. But that was in 2003 that LeBron did that. Uh, Something else that'll mess with your mind is, if LeBron would have been drafted one year earlier, he would have played against Michael Jordan. That's how long ago that was. Uh, Kobe Bryant, who retired in like 2016, played against Michael Jordan two years, Jordan's last two years on the Bulls when he won two of his championships. That's how long ago that was. But when you're thinking about these players that have just retired recently or are currently playing, when you think about that and how fast time goes, it really messes with your mind. But I have what is called a pre-millennial view of the Bible. I believe things will get worse and worse before the Lord returns to straighten it out. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. No doubt the further time goes, the more I see openly wicked things happening before my eyes. When I was a kid, you did not you did not see homosexuality just every time you turned on the TV and in all the music and the movies and the TV shows. I remember on TV when it was considered funny to make fun of a homosexual. I remember as a kid when Eminem, the filthy satanic rapper, made fun of queers in his music. And he would call them fags, and uh, he acted like it was disgusting. But now, you do that, and you're not going to have much of a career. And no doubt, the further time goes, the more I see these openly wicked things happening before before our eyes. Each second passes, and you can't get it back. Each second passes, and things get worse. Some people want to kill time. Some wish to get it back. Some want to time travel. Some people say time heals all things. Everybody has an idea of how they want to spend their time and how they want it to go by faster and how they wish it was going slower and then some people just want to go back and do it all over again. We need to be understanding of the times that we're living in. And 1 Chronicles 12.32 talks about men that had an understanding of the times. And that's what we need to do. The Bible tells me what time it is right now. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul tells us about perilous times. And it seems like we are in those now. And then in Romans 13, 11, he says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And that's the salvation of our flesh at the rapture. Time's ticking away. We're one second closer to the rapture than we were five seconds ago. Uh, The more you live, the quicker time goes. When you look at your grandparents, remember that once they were the same age you were. They weren't thinking about death. And now they're laying, and that's all they think about. They're laying on the bed thinking about death. Whereas 30, 40 years ago, They were in the same position as you, just thinking about the next 30 or 40 years, and in that 30 years past. Look at it this way. 15 years ago, I was 15. Maybe you were 30 15 years ago. But that next 15 years is going to go by faster than the last 15 years. And it's only going to take two of those 15 years to put 30 more years on your life. If you're 40... You got 30 years till you're 70. One day you're 15, the next day you'll wake up and you're 50. And if you're not careful, you'll wake up at 70 with absolutely nothing, having done nothing for the Lord, wasted the gift of time. 
And Proverbs 16, 31 says, The hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. How great would it be to wake up 70 years old after living for the Lord for 40, 50 years? How great would it be to wake up 70 years old and have read the Bible around 100 times? I mean, think about it like this. If you're 30 right now and you read the Bible two times a year from now to your 70, that's 80 times you'll have read the Bible by the time you're 70 years old. Most 70-year-olds have not read the Bible through one time. But time, it began in Genesis 1-1 when it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God is outside of time. Deuteronomy 33-27 calls him the eternal God. He's not limited by time. Time ends in Revelation 21 when God wipes away all tears from their eyes. How God sees time is different than how we see it. God sees from beginning to ending. After it happens and before it happens, he can see it. It's like when you have a DVD, you can rewind it, pause it, fast forward it. He can see the beginning from the end and even has the power to place people forward in time. For example, John was taken forward in time and saw the events of the tribulation, the rapture, the second coming, eternity, the millennial reign. It says that he saw these things with his own two eyes. In Revelation 21.10, it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the heavenly Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So John was in the future on a great and high mountain and saw new Jerusalem come down from God out of heaven. And God had the pl power to place him there. John was put in God's time-traveling machine. He just picked him up and carried him forward in time. But God is always present. He's always present in the past, present in the present, and present in the future, and then present in eternity. Uh, it's hard to explain, but he's just, he's so omnipresent that he's present throughout time from Genesis to Revelation. And that's why you see in the Old Testament when it's got those prophecies of Jesus, it'll sometimes talk about Jesus like it had already happened, like he had already died on the cross. It'll put it in the past tense. But here is how God views time in Second Peter 3, 8. It says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So if humans have been around 6,000 years, then to God we have only been here six, seven days by his view of time, depending on how many thousands of years we've been here, six, seven thousand years. Uh, God gifts men with small bits of time. Me and you, God's gifting us with little small bits of time. Now God gifted some men with much larger amounts of time, but still in, ter in terms of eternity, it's still a very small amount of time. For example, these men that were gifted with large, uh, large amounts of time, a man named Methuselah lived to be 969 years old in Genesis 5.27. Jared lived to be 962 years old. Noah lived to be 950 years old. Adam, 930. Seth, 912. Canaan, 910. Enos, 905. Mahalalel, 895. Lamech, 777. Enoch, 365. Uh, these men lived so long that Adam would have talked face to face with Methuselah. Methuselah talked face to face with Enoch, Noah, and Shem, Noah's son. And Abraham was 175 when he died. So you can see a decrease that's going to come along as time went on after the flood. Jacob was 147. Isaac was 180. Joseph was 110. Moses was 120. And now people today, me and you, we just get 70 and 80 years. Psalms 90 and verse 10 says, The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. 
So our lives, the life of man has went from 900 something years all the way down to 70 or 80 years. But the fall and wickedness of man caused lifespan to decrease. People began living for the flesh before the flood. So the lifespans of men decrease. This pictures how the more you live for the flesh, the less life you will have, the less time you will have to do something for God. Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Romans eight thirteen says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Why die before your time? Because you're living for the flesh. Ecclesiastes seven seventeen says, Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Some people say you can't die unless it's your time. But these verses seem to show you can speed up the process a little bit. Jesus Christ accomplished so much in just 33 and a half years when he died on the cross. He didn't waste any time. And that's what we need to look at now. Look at now is wasted time. When you're lost, you were wasting your gift of time. Each second that you stayed lost was a waste of time. Ephesians 2.2 2 says, Where in time past you walked according to, court, according to the course of this world. Notice it says, In time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, and the children of disobedience. When you live like you're lost after you're saved, you are also wasting time. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. If you want, don't want to waste time, then walk with the Lord. Before salvation, you were unprofitable. You weren't getting anything out of your time on the earth. That's what you can consider your time before you were saved. It was just unprofitable. And Philemon 10 and 11 it says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. So after you're saved, you need to go from being unprofitable to profitable in your time. There are 86,400 seconds in a day, 1,440 minutes in a day, 24 hours in a day. And one of the devil's greatest tools is distractions and time wasters. He wants to take as much as that of that 86,400 seconds as he can. So we need to redeem the time, using it wisely. In 2 Kings 20 and verse 6, Hezekiah gets 15 years added to his life when he prayed to the Lord for it. If you've wasted a lot of time, pray that the Lord will somehow give you some time to serve him. Now, what are some ways to redeem the time? I think rising up early in the morning is a good way to redeem the time. In Genesis 22, 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning when he went to sacrifice Isaac, which was one of the greatest pictures of God sacrificing his son in the Bible. Moses was rising up early in the morning when God gave him the Ten Commandments when he was writing Genesis through Deuteronomy. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 20 shows us that David would rise up early in the morning, and David is one of the greatest types of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Multitasking is a great way to redeem the time. Make up for time you've lost or wasted. Memorizing Scripture is something that redeems the time. Memorizing Scripture while working on the job is a good way to redeem the time. Working an honest day's work is something you will be rewarded for according to the Bible. And memorizing scripture at the same time can make up for lost time. You're doing two beneficial things at once. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Is what you're doing going to edify someone else? Is that how you're spending your time? Are you doing things that aren't beneficial to your time? But Psalms 119.11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Hiding the word in your heart 
is one of the greatest ways to redeem the time. Index cards with verses written on them can help you memorize scripture. Listening to the audio Bible on the way to work can also help. If your workplace allows you to wear headphones, you can memorize scripture this way. Uh, recording your voice is a good way to redeem the time. Many preachers who are dead and gone are still earning rewards through their voice on CDs and tapes and MP3s. I mean, when you listen to a dead preacher or a dead Bible teacher uh, and you're getting something out of it, those preachers and teachers are still earning rewards even after they've passed. Isn't it a just crazy to think about how you can record your voice and people around the world can hear it and get edified off of it. And then 50 years after you're gone, from where you recorded your voice 50 years ago, it's still playing. It can still be played on an MP3 or a tape or a CD. Even when you're not working for God, someone somewhere would be listening to your voice. Writing things down that would help someone is a good way to redeem the time. Schofield, Ruckman, Hoffman, J. Vernon McGee wrote study Bibles and commentaries. And even though these, a lot of those men are dead, most of the men I just mentioned are dead, you know, their writings are still edifying people to this day. R writing something down for your children that they will continue to read in the future is, it, is, is a good way to redeem the time. Using the gift of time wisely benefits us in eternity when there is no more time. Psalms 90.12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Say to yourself, you're going to do something beneficial today. Something for God today. Putting it off, procrastinating, that's just a tool of the devil. Is how you're spending your time edifying to someone. Is it beneficial to your fellowship with the Lord? Now next, you can use your pastime. Romans 8.18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, the, you can suffer in this present time, and you can use things from your past that you did as a, dirty sinner before you were saved if you have a talent a gift a hobby you enjoyed before you were saved you can translate that into something you do for god after you're saved playing an instrument singing drawing this way your pastime is it isn't a complete waste uh, say you was a good guitar player before you were saved and you spent all that time practicing on the guitar now you're saved and you don't want to play wicked music anymore, so you start playing godly music. And all that time you spent practicing becomes time that was beneficial to working for God now. If you're good drawing, you, it's the same way. Instead of drawing filthy pictures, draw something that gives glory to God. This way your pastime isn't a complete waste. But as Paul said in Romans 13 and 11, it's time to wake up and do something because each second that passes puts us closer to the rapture where the time for us to do something for God in the flesh will be over. Uh, 1 Peter 3.10 says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Biting down your tongue and not constantly fighting and arguing with someone every day is using time wisely. Life is too short to waste it arguing and complaining and bickering and screaming at somebody. Deuteronomy 5.33 says, You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Walk in the ways of the Lord, you'll prolong your days. How long you live, in a sense, and just in a sense, is up to you. Are you going to live for God, 
or are you going to live for the devil? The devil can give you temporary thrills, just like he gives the rock stars and the rap singers. I don't know if this is true. They say the average age of those people is like 36 years old. They had a good time for 36 years or so. But the Bible says bloody and deceitful men won't live out half their days. And if you would rather serve God, suffer affliction with the people of God, rather than to enjoy pleasures of sin for a season, then maybe the Lord will prolong your days, give you more time. But time is short. The older you get, the more you realize it. The last 15 years, as I said, will go faster than the first 15 years of your life. And there are Bible verses that will help us memorize this and realize it. James 4.14 says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. Years ago, my pastor preached a sermon about this, and he used like a little can of something that you spray to illustrate how our life is just like a vapor. Like, as soon as you spray that and that mist comes out or that vapor, it just vanishes away. And that's how short your life is when it comes to eternity. 1 Corinthians 7.29 says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. Just flat out says it. The time is short, Job 7.7. 7. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eyes shall see no more good. Just like you can't recall the breezes you have felt on your arm when you're walking down the road or something and it's windy and you felt, you can't recall all those breezes that, that you felt in your life. That's how your, your life is. Your life is as wind. You know, people just forget your name. After you die, I mean, nobody, just like nobody remembers the wind blowing on their arm, it's the same way nobody's going to remember your name and what you did unless you just really do something for God and make some kind, type of an impact on the world. 1 Corinthians twenty nine fifteen says, For we are strangers before thee and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. So your days are just like a shadow that passes away and when you look at those pictures those old pictures of people that are dead and gone nobody knows their name it's like it's just a shadow nobody remembers who they are there's not really much sign that they was ever even here and that's just kind of creepy to think about in a way proverbs 27 1 says boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth our life and time here is fragile. And on my way home from work, I just think about how if the driver in the other lane fell asleep or had a heart attack, they could come right over into my lane and it would just be over. Psalms 144.4 says, A man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. First Peter 1.24 says, For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withereth. And the flower thereof falleth away. Second Samuel fourteen fourteen. For we must needs die, and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Just like when you spill water on the carpet, and you can't get the water back up in the cup. That's how your time ends. Once your time is spent, that time you spent's gone. You can't gather it back up. I mean, each second passing away, you don't get it back. Psalms 102.11, My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. Psalm 78.39, For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Just like time, it doesn't come back again. That's why I don't want to waste your time with these short studies. I hope I can teach you something in 30 minutes, make you more interested in the Bible. So after you listen to this, you'll want to get in your Bible and spend all your time in the Bible. I don't want to beat you in the head with the Bible and just tell you a bunch of rules and regulations. I don't want to use this time like most people use on on here, on these videos, to badmouth every person besides myself or talk about my personal opinion. 
or things that just bug me and just slander everybody and badmouth everybody, that's a complete waste of time. It edifies nobody. To sit around, just like that ruckmanism.org website, that's just a bunch of slander, and it does nothing but waste people's time. It doesn't edify anybody. If your whole ministry is based around bad-mouthing other Christians, then you're not really in the ministry. You just have a ministry of wrecking everybody else's ministry. That's not redeeming the time. That's not edifying people. Job 14.1 says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. God has given us a few days to do something for him. Job 9.25, Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away, they see no good. Ecclesiastes 2.16, For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten, and how dieth the wise man as the fool. It's crazy to think about. More people know Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, Amy Winehouse, um, Tupac, Notorious B.I.G., and all these filthy, wicked people more than they know all these great dead preachers from days gone by. I mean, if you go up to somebody and say, hey, do you know who J. Harold Smith is? Or do you know who Harold Sattler is? Do you know who Hugh Pyle is? Do you know who Don Mangus is? They're going to be like, who are you talking about? But you say, you know who Jimi Hendrix is, Kurt Cobain. There's more remembrance for a moron like those people than there is for a godly person. I mean, you're both going to die. The godly die, the ungodly die. But you want to use your time wisely here. And even if you're not known for the things that you do here, God sees every bit of it in heaven and you actually get more rewards for it if nobody knew about it here and gave you glory for it here because then you'll just get the glory for it in heaven. So don't quit doing right just because you're not getting noticed for doing right. And if you're doing right to get noticed, then you're not doing it for the, for the right reason anyway. Psalms 90 and verse 9 says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Doesn't that just sound like, you know, when you sit down there with your papa or your mamma and they just sit and tell you some tale that happened when they was young about how they walked in five foot of snow to get to school every day or something like that? We spend our years as a tale that's told. Your grandpa will sit and tell you a story that happened 60, 70 years ago and he can't even remember it. He just has those little fuzzy memories. You know, if, if people... If you can't even remember stories from your past that happened to you personally, then how are people going to remember you at all, you know? You know, I have some fuzzy little memories from when I was really young. And if I can't even remember them, then how are people even going to remember my life, you know? It's impossible for your memory to just go on and on and on. Uh, Psalms 89, 47, and 48 says, Remember how short my time is. Wherefore hast thou made all men in vain? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? You're not going to escape escape death. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. We're all going to die. But while you're here, don't forget about the Lord. Don't forget about your family. Many men will go to work. Then they'll go out with their friends. Then by the time they get home, their family's in bed. Don't miss out on your kids. Teach your kids something every day and make them laugh every day. When you hug your kid, remember that as time passes, she's going to get older and older. And there may be a day when you can't hug her anymore. There will come a day when you hug her for the last time. But we need to finish our course. We need to finish. When it comes for our time to end, we need to finish our, have finished our course. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. 
I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, so shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul finished his course. Noah finished his course. He is called a preacher of righteousness. Abraham is listed in the hall of faith. Moses did what God said, and he gets to come back and preach in the time of Jacob's trouble as one of the two witnesses. He finished his course, and he gets some extra time, gets to come back. Uh, David is referred to as a man after God's own heart. You know, he finished his course. Hopefully, we will finish our course and use our time wisely so that we can get crowns at the judgment seat of Christ and be called a good and faithful servant. Philippians 1, 23 and 24 says, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So although we should have a desire to be in heaven, the Lord still wants us to savor and cherish every moment that He's given us. He's given us the gift of time, living for Him, keeping His commandments, serving others not for forsaking our families. But time really hasn't started for you if you're not saved. All the time you've spent on this earth has been wasted time. And if you're still listening to this and you're not saved, I want to give you the gospel. And Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. He died on the cross for you because you're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the way to get saved is come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are and believe on Jesus Christ. Believe on the gospel to save you. Believe on Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross to pay your sin debt. So you're in debt because of your sin and the wages of sin is death. If you die without Jesus Christ, you will go to hell for eternity because you didn't get your sins paid for. Jesus Christ died for everyone's sins. He paid for the sin on the cross. You just have to accept the payment. And you can reject that payment. But hopefully you will come to Jesus Christ today before it's too late. Romans ten thirteen says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says in Acts 16.31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It's by his shed blood that you're saved. When he was on the cross, he shed his blood. Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ died for you, shed his blood for you, was buried, and resurrected the third day for you. So hopefully you will believe on him today.